All right, welcome back to the Canadian Gun Vault. Behind the vault door, I'm your host, Mark Morelli, and uh, I'm a gun owner, and I really don't care who knows it. It's one of those uh, security things that uh, you know, people that own firearms always uh, have to consider. And uh, certainly, if you're going to make the announcement, uh, you know, successfully to your friends, uh, you know, definitely make them aware that, you know, you exercise the next, the necessary precautions to make it possible to secure your firearms uh, and make sure that nobody takes them. Uh, security has always been an issue for the firearm community. And as a result, this uh, secrecy that we are forced to engage in uh, to make ourselves feel a little bit safer that nobody will try and break into your house uh, and steal your guns has kind of forced us into the underground. And it's certainly left, you know, 80% of the Canadian population wondering, you know, what we might be up to. Uh, you know, there's there's people out there with guns, you know, and then they don't, they don't really tell them much. So, you know, I created the Canadian Gun Vault because I wanted to give uh, people an, an opportunity, an opportunity to, uh, you know, kind of get exposed to the firearm community and, and to see them in action and to see the things that we love, you know. And rather than sh being shrouded in this... Um, you know, air of uh, mystery, you know, where the anti-gunners can kind of really play with people's fears. Uh, instead of doing that, which historically hasn't worked for us very well in the past, uh, you know, this whole let's hide somewhere and hope they don't come get us attitude uh, that's so very pervasive in the uh, firearm community. You know, we've been we've had our rights stomped on so many times. Uh, you got a lot of people that are uh, gun shy, for lack of a better term, and are, are more than willing to kind of like hide out and not draw attention to themselves, which I think is completely the wrong move, you know. Um, as a police officer for years, they 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 used to take me into the uh, you know the annual you know use of force training classes. They'd run through these scenarios, and inevitably, you know, uh, I was guilty of stepping into people, uh, you know, really quickly uh, as a police officer when I made the determination that you know I was going to have to grab somebody and or you know um, if I was in a situation with a hostile person, I would try negotiation, and uh, I got better with you know you know. Uh, tactical communication as I matured as an officer, but I still, even in my final years of policing, I still was pretty aggressive. You know, I would step in pretty quick. And, uh, you know, that whole time and distance of your friends didn't seem to really, you know, uh, compute with me uh, as, as kind of an aggressive Italian uh, male with probably, you know, a slightly um, overabundance of testosterone, you know, uh, having the Morale name kind of made me a little bit more aggressive, you know, and I wasn't afraid of contact, you know, I played football and, uh, you know, pull high four touchdowns, one game kind of situation, you know, like I, but I, I, you know, I was raised, uh, you know, to be tough and to kind of push yourself, uh, physically. And so I would, you know, step into people really quick and I was always criticized for that, you know, and, um, I'm just, I'm just trying to think of, you know, where I'm going with this. Hey. Hmm? Are you listening at all? I am listening. Where, 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 where I lost my train of thought there for a second. I got, <laughs> you want me to got off onto got, well, I got off onto a tangent. I know. You know, uh, I, I don't know. I suddenly began to talk about you know uh, high school football. I don't know how I arrived at that location, but uh, you know, going on, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't think a lot. I don't think a lot of people out there realize how difficult it is to kind of run a uh, podcast by yourself and sort of um, engage in a monologue. You know, when you're not really in interviewing people, you sometimes rely very heavily on the uh, interaction of others to kind of carry a conversation. I, I don't seem to have any difficulty doing it on my own um, when I, once I feel comfortable. And I've, I've, had, <laughs> I've had a bit of discomfort, you know, and there's been a bit of a learning curve. I, uh, you know, I haven't done a lot of talking. Uh, certainly, I find myself uh, not not always in a position where I feel like I want to share off the last couple of years I've had before I started the Canadian Gun Vault. Uh, but uh, now, you know, I, I'm sitting here, you know, with a microphone, you know, trying to think of things to say that people might find entertaining. Uh, and at the same time, I think it's important to kind of convey this message. You know, the Canadian gun owners have really uh, time and again had their rights stomped on. And so, you know, with that in mind, if you've got this group that's uh, already, you know, feeling like they've been singled out, and I mean, com running completely contrary to uh, what everything that they teach today is that, you know, you shouldn't single out one group. You can't blame everybody because one person does something. I mean, there's just, there's this world of excuses and uh, complete uh, ignorance, uh, you know, to the facts 
uh, that, you know, the, the Canadian legal firearm community, like the people that actually get trained, get licensing, they're government approved, you know, they're, they're vetted, they're cleared. Uh, there's references. You got to talk to ex-girlfriends. I mean, like you got to be, you got to be just shy of a, a you know, a, a living saint and to own firearms legitimately in this country. And yet every time we turn around, somebody in office is passing a new law it seems that only targets us and meanwhile like the the very reason people are claiming to be scared of us uh you know the, the these people that are terrified of guns and they're they, you know they're t- terrified of violent crime and so am i but not around legal gun owners like that's that's one of those things that i found myself just blown away by is you've got this group of fantastic people that have ab- absolutely no interest in breaking the law and everything they generate seems to target this group okay which quite frankly because they obey the law they're just easy targets i mean like what, what are your options really you know we're banning that you can't have it like you know turn it in for destruction well no i don't want to uh you know would be the answer of anybody else if it was anything other than a gun and so you've you know got this group of people that are kind of forced into a position where they actually become the thing that people are afraid of if they decide that they're not going to do what the government tells them which is completely wrong um you know if i showed up at your door tomorrow you know, as a regular Joe citizen, you know, in my house, I'm eating breakfast. I'm trying to, you know, get up and be on my way to work. You know, I'm trying to pay the bills. I got a wife that's angry at me. And, you know, there's a knock at my door and somebody says, hi, you know, uh, we're from the government. Uh, your car is blue. It's uh, sitting in the driveway and we're going to seize it. Uh, we're not going to compensate you for it. We're not going to give you any money for it. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, we, yes, we know you paid for it. We, we know you worked for it and bought it. And, uh, you know, that, hey, you worked real hard for that. I mean, I could see that, you know, you're having a hard time making ends meet. But, you know, you paid for it. So, you know, you got, oh, let's let's just say it's a nice one. You know, like, uh, you know, it's a, you know, like a Mustang. You know, like you worked hard for it. And, you know, it's taken a lot of man hours to get uh, that car. You're quite proud of it. You know, you uh, spend a lot of time with it. You know, you uh, you drive it, you enjoy it, you find something in it that you, uh, you know, really delivers a, a relaxation, you know, in your life. You know, like you, you enjoy driving the car. You know, you bought yourself a car because you wanted that car, you love that car, you're going to, you know, wax and wash that car, and you're going to drive that car. And one day the government shows up at your door and says, by the way, you're not allowed to have that. Okay. Like... Now what? Like, you're not taking it. Yeah, we're taking it. Well, how, how are you going to take my car? Right? Like, I mean, I, I bought my car. That's my car. No, it's not. By the way, we told you that, uh, you know, it's uh, it's written right in there. <laughs> you know, in the uh, charter. It, it's really not your property anyway. So, okay, so who, who did the work for it then? Like, I mean, who owns it? Like, I mean, last time I checked, my name was on the slip. Uh, nope, nope. The, the queen owes it. All right, the queen. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I've never met the queen, so I'm going to argue that, you know, I, she doesn't own my car, right? Nope, nope, she owns your car uh, because you don't have any real rights to it. I mean, you're that guy. You're standing in your doorway and you're going, like, there's no way. So you're going to take my car and I'm not allowed to use it. Well, hold on. We're going to look at it. <laughs> We're going to we're going to determine whether or not you might be able to keep it. Um, you know, chances are you won't. OK, uh, that one. Nope. That one. You won't. That one's OK. You, th- this one. OK. No. You know what? Well, hold on. Let's look at the list. Uh, nope. Sorry. I'm not allowed to own that one either. Right. Well, you're kind of, you know, you're screwed. Uh, I think it's fascinating that anybody in their right mind would think it's okay for the government to walk into your life, take your property, and not offer you any kind of compensation. And or they'll sit there and they'll look at a long list of your property and determine whether or not you're allowed to keep it, not keep it. Uh, Oh, you can keep it, but it can never, you know, go out the door again. Um, So you got to keep that there. Uh, Like to be a gun owner in this country really puts you in a position where you're subject to, uh, you know, some pretty uh, harsh regulation uh, already. Like arguably Canada has some of the tightest restrictions in the world. 
And so here you are operating this environment where you have to be perfect and we have very tight regulations and the government every once in a while likes to swoop in and say, you can't have that. It doesn't matter if you've owned it for decades and it doesn't matter if it's, you know, uh, never been used for anything other than punching holes in paper and you've enjoyed it and you worked hard for it. Forget all that. You know, like you're just not allowed to have it and there's really no good reason for it. And nobody, nobody seems to understand, you know, uh, other than gun owners that you can have you know your property taken from you at any time so i mean you really can only go one of a couple of routes here uh i think you know changing the law would be the best way to go you know um you know there's there's a lot of opportunity and some great places they can make some revision in the law that would certainly streamline uh you know the system and you know definitely close some you know vague uh, ambiguous like terms that are in it but you know instead we're going to trust the government that doesn't seem to be making any good decisions at all lately uh we've got a leader that arguably has uh, never been you know uh, under more scrutiny than this one is now um you know a lot of unhappy people but they're gonna <laughs> they're gonna take a group uh, an advisory committee, a bunch of people that really know very little or nothing about guns or hate guns, right? They're going to take this group, you know, that consists almost entirely of people that dislike the very thing that they're about to regulate. Uh, the last time we put together a group like this, it ended uh, costing the country billions of dollars in a uh, registry that was scrapped. Uh, if we put people in charge that know absolutely nothing about firearms uh, and or totally hate firearms, we're going to have some very unhappy groups of people that are going to be, uh, I'm sure, uh, disgusted with the amount of money that's spent, uh, the ineffective nature of whatever they come up with. Uh, how about, you know what, it's just not going to be fair. The process won't be fair. And that's not Canadian. And I really have a problem with that. So my thinking is, is that we actually hold them accountable for this and say, look, if you're going to create a committee, you're going to make one that is completely objective and without bias to generate these laws rather than putting together right the dream team of anti-gunners and a couple of token players thrown in the mix who uh, arguably you know may just go along with it who knows uh i'm gonna say that if you uh, stack that deck that high uh that we should try as gun owners to knock it over right and i think that means that everybody needs to write into their member of parliament uh, we need to write into Ralph Goodale's office and you can sit there and you can say, well, writing doesn't do anything. I say, if everybody does their bit that we're going to get something done, uh, we start with letters, all right? If you're unhappy with the idea of being punished for the crimes of others, write that down on a piece of paper, right? And send it into Ralph Goodale's office, right? The office of emergency preparedness. Right, because we're preparing for an emergency. They're about to waste, right, probably millions of dollars, right, just to create legislation that will only be scrapped in the future. Because I can't imagine a world where the liberal government is reelected in 2019. I hope to God it doesn't happen. Because we as gun owners had better take this seriously. Uh, if they get a second term, we're going to be in for the fight of our lives. We're in it now. If you don't think we are, you're mistaken. Uh, if this current government isn't defeated right, at the election booths in 2019 it is going to be catastrophic for this country and it's not just guns right it just seems like money's going out the door and nobody seems to know why it's going there and uh, we're not questioning the correct people when it comes to uh, breaches of ethical conduct i think it's really important right that we support good people in Parliament, like Michelle Rumpel, right, who uh, finds herself, I'm sure, at odds on multiple levels with this current government. I, I don't know. I watch her uh, in parliamentary session, and I see a very passionate woman that wants to fight uh, for Canadian pride, you know, because we've lost quite a bit of it. I think it's really important that we get back into the fight. You know, as gun owners, as patriotic Canadians, I, I'm uh, not encouraging a armed uprising. Uh, but I do suggest is that you pick up the pen and actually write a letter. Write a letter. Take the time it takes to write a letter. I know you all got busy days. I got busy days too. But I'm going to put my pen on that paper and I'm going to set aside, you know, an hour 
to just say that this is enough. We've got a group that needs to uh, be disbanded. There's no way they're going to be fair. And since this is Canada, why we're going to insist on some fairness. So if everybody picks up their pens and gets them to paper and writes two letters, one right to their member of parliament, reminding them that we vote them into office and that you're not happy with any support given to any kind of legislation that moves forward, uh, forward on the Canadian firearm community uh, with this group at the helm. There's absolutely no way. That group has to be disbanded. So if everybody writes into their member of parliament and into Ralph Goodale's office, I think that we should express uh, what it is that we're concerned about. And I think that that's fair. And I think that they should respond to everybody with something more than a automated response. And I mean, that means we should be comparing notes. If they're going to send, send every one of us back this rubber stamped, right? Bullshit automated response, right? Everybody gets the same one, right? They pretend like they sign it, uh, whether they do or don't, I don't know. But I can tell you right now that uh, insisting that they actually respond to us, you know, with a letter that isn't uh, mass produced, saying the same thing, that we're going to be working in partnership with the hunting community and the firearm community and, you know, to come up with fair legislation that's good for everybody. I mean, I remember reading that letter in the 90s that said, uh, as a celebration of legitimate firearm ownership in this country and the, the strong uh, you know, history connected to it, we only ask that you register these guns. And then they banned them 18 months later. And you know that, that giant betrayal that occurred back then is not something that uh, one easily forgets if you live through it. So I think it's really important that we all take the time to uh, write our member of parliament, write Ralph, Ralph Goodell's office. I can almost uh, barely get through that without laughing a little bit, because I, I mean, I really don't want to cause a lot of problems for Ralph. Uh, you know, Ralph's toe on the line. Uh, but the truth is, is that Ralph needs to smarten up if he's going to support things like this, because I mean, it has nothing to do with safety and everybody knows it. And it's about time we start to call them out on it. Anyway, that's about all the time I have tonight for this week's podcast, uh, the Canadian Gun Vault Behind the Vault Door. I hope you've enjoyed it, and I hope you all have had a great and safe weekend. Have a good night, folks.